Greetings, everyone. Pete Burrow here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of What's Hot with Sea of Tranquility today. He's actually in the captain's chair today, Mr. Stephen Reed, all the way from Scotland. Good afternoon, my friend. How are you? I got that. I got that oh, right. Very today, good. Well, yes, you got it right today, Peter. Good afternoon. Good morning to you. Yes. Good whatever it is to everyone that wa that's watching. It's probably the middle of the night for somebody. So yes, uh, yes, I am good. Thanks, Peter. Um, and delighted to be on and talking about a most exciting book. We're talking about Emerson, Lake and Palmer, ELP. Talking about a very exciting book. It is, it's a thing of beauty, is what it is. So that's, that's what today is all about. Well, let, let's hear a knock on that, because we got to know how dense that book is. I always like to do that. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> this, this is not mucking around. This is a <laughs> proper book. I mean, I'm almost needing both hands for it. Um, <laughs> Put it that way. Not quite, but yeah, it's, I mean, it, the only thing you could, the only downside you could say about a book like this is it's awkward to read. But considering what's inside, it needs to be the size. Because uh, this is, it's beautiful outside and it's beautiful inside. So yeah, yeah. really quite excited about that actually. It's, it's very good. Well, that's like, that seems to be like the new trend, and I don't know if Martin Popoff kind of started that with those kind of coffee table books he's doing, but it seems like now any like really in-depth book with a lot of info and packed with photographs has to come in something like that. You can't just get away with, uh, you know, something like this size, which, I mean, this is great, but if you want something like that on, on a, you know, a real legacy band, you almost have to go full born the, the big coffee table treatment. <laughs> I think there's a realisation that most people at this stage, I mean, they know about the bats. You know, we know the history, we know the ups and the downs, and there's lots of that with ELP. There's lots of ups, huge amount of ups, and the massive, you know, achievements. But there are also a few downsides too that, that kind of came along the way as any band that lasted as long as they did, which is how the book makes it feel. The book's very interesting. I'll do some kind of housekeeping first. So... There are three editions of the book. This is the standard edition that I've been sent. Okay, and as a standard edition goes, I have not been shortchanged. This is pretty spectacular. There's also a signature edition, which is limited to 500 copies. Now that, the book itself is fully endorsed by the band's families and by Carol Palmer. He is part of the book. He writes the introduction, the foreword to the book, uh, and he's clearly been uh, involved in it all the way through. So the signature edition, as I say, it's limited to 500 copies. It's signed by Arden Emerson. So that is the son um, of Keith. It's signed by Greg's wife, Regina Lake, and it's signed by Carl Palmer. Okay, so it comes in a handmade clamshell box. There's a stamped and a numbered art print, uh, which is a photograph of the band themselves. There's a large family tree, which is made by Pete Frame. I don't know if anyone knows Pete Frame that did the, the hand-drawn family trees. It was a, a series on BBC Two over here in the UK where it charted bands like Deep Purple and various things. And it, and it was based around his drawings of family trees. I was a real fan of the series. Some of the bands you liked more than others, but the series was really good. And I actually bought the book on the back of it and they all fold out and oh, that's wow. the kind of beauty. So the, the poster, as a poster size, so yeah, it takes you through all the, the prehistory of ELP, then obviously the offshoots of where everybody went and what happened, well, during and after, with where they went and what they did. So that itself, that's probably the only thing I, oh, I really would have wished I had that in the edition that I've got, because I really, when I was younger, I used to, and I've still got them, reference books, I used to love to see, oh, he was in them, and, and, and they, they did this, and then that guy left and she came in, and then they moved over here and I would go and buy all of these albums. And I, I still have a thing. For yeah, I always love those family trees, too, because it's it's so many of these bands that we love growing up were intertwined in weird ways that, you know, uh, on the surface, you couldn't even possibly imagine. You know, like bands like I mean, like a lot of these prog bands and bands like Sabbath and Uriah Heep and Whitesnake and Rainbow and Gillen. It's like you look back at their history, Deep Purple, and like they've all in a weird way, sort of been in the same band together through other yeah. bandmates over the years. It's crazy stuff, crazy stuff. Very incestuous. It was yeah, all, you know, he yeah. was in name with them, and then those two split, but he went here, and then they joined up there, but that guy from this band was also in that band. I love that. I absolutely love that, and there's nothing better than picking up an old album that you've 
you know, heard about or knew and looking at it and going, oh, I never knew they were on this. Yeah. I, I do like that as well. It's easy please, put it that way. Yeah. Um, and that edition, so the signature, not the standard, also comes with a 60 minute CD of previously unheard interviews with the three guys. Okay, wow. so there's that edition, and then you can also go further than that. There is an ultimate edition, and there are three versions of the ultimate edition, all limited to only 50 each. Okay, now this book is available for pre order right now. It should be out at the end of November, start of December, and around there. The world is a strange, crazy place right now, so they haven't quite got their publication date locked in, but obviously. Books exist, okay, so don't panic. Books exist, they are real, they are there. It's not one of those projects. Um, so it's just a case of locking down that date. I've had a look on the website today. All editions appear to still be available for pre-order because the pre-order did open a couple of weeks ago. So the ultimate edition, there are three types uh, with 50 of each, okay? So they come bound in a vintage recycled leather cover, okay? Um, there is an archival quality matching numbered art print, okay, in each. So I presume what that means by that is if you've got a picture of the band, which is numbered, then your art print will match that. Okay. So the three editions, there's one for Carol, one for Keith, and one for Greg, okay. Carol has signed one. His art print is the Manticore, which is obviously the label company, the emblem and the logo that was created by Carol. He signed that. And then there are pictures of the other two guys in the other two editions, one in each, obviously, signed by the relevant person, Arne and Regina. So that's kind of what you're upgrading to. Beautiful leather book, leather bound book. It looks absolutely stunning. It all comes in the clamshell box. You get everything that came with a signature edition. But obviously, so it sounds like they're opting for the clamshell box as opposed to putting like a gorgeous kind of like slipcase cover or something or a dust yes, jacket on the outside. Exactly. I haven't seen the clamshell box. I mean, you can have a look on, on the website and it does look looks the business. Uh, it's, I mean, and okay, there's a premium. I mean, this book's in around the £40 mark. You're considerably more as you move up oh, through, sure. those, through, through those options. But there is really exclusive in there that you're not going to find anywhere else. And it would appear they're not going to appear anywhere else either. Now, the only place that you can get the book is www.elpbook.com. Okay? And that's key. That's the only place that you can get it. So if you want it, that's where you have to head to. Okay. And one more time, so, www.elpbook.com. No hyphens, no nothing. Just elpbook.com. So that's make, it. Make sure if you, you, if you were just to look at it, it says Elp Book. Elp Book. E-L-P Book. That's what it is. Absolutely. And that's the, and the website is there. It's dead easy to negotiate. So it's and it shows you what's in. You can have a look and, and, and have a look at what's in all the different editions and choose your option that, that you, you fancy most, more than anything else. So as I say, full cooperation with the band, Carl is executive editor, is the way that it's been put. Um, and his forward, although not long, as you would expect, really sets you up for exactly what's going to be inside. This is a book about Emerson, Lake and Palmer. It's not a book about ELP, okay? So there's no Powell, that didn't exist, didn't happen. All right, there's no three that doesn't didn't exist and didn't happen. Okay, <laughs> the band don't split; they just have periods where they don't do anything. Okay, so it's a little don't do anything, don't talk to each other, don't have any other projects, no solo albums, none of that stuff, right? <laughs> Not solo albums are mentioned, but only as in I may have been doing a solo album. I may have been go thinking about a solo album. Gotcha. We never get a solo album title. We never. None of this in, in, in the, the kind of parallel book universe, none of this happened, none of it exists. Okay. Okay. It's, it's an interesting take. It's very pure. And Carol does go to great pains to state that's what he wanted from the book. He wants it to be about Emerson, Lake and Palmer. Okay. So the way that the book is put together is it's, there is a narrative and it tells a story. However, it's not just a straight story. It's all quotes from the three guys. That's all that's in the book. The whole book runs as quotes from the three guys. Okay. So most of what comes from Greg comes from a 2016 interview with the legendary DJ Bob Harris, which has been previously unpublished. 
So it is all new, in inverted commas. Obviously, there's things that we've heard before, but it's a new interview. Uh, new interviews with Carl with Bruce Palato, which were taking place this year and last year. So that's all pretty much new. And then the stuff uh, that comes from Keith Emerson is from the long out of print autobiography, Pictures of an Exhibitionist. Now, I've never read that, so to me that was also all new. Interwoven in amongst that is also a lot of vintage quotes and interview snippets and various things just to obviously help the story run because they do tell the story of the band, but they don't just sit down and tell you the story of the band. It's all quotes and a lot of it feels very of the time. It's like they're talking about what's happening today as you go through the book. There is a lot of reminiscing and looking back, but it feels like you're kind of covering the periods as they happen because you're talking more interviews as opposed to sitting down and talking about my life as it happened all those years ago. Right. And I really quite like that kind of tone about the book. It makes it feel very fresh. It makes it feel very kind of relevant in actual fact. And as we'll have a look, of, I mentioned to Peter before we actually started the show there, I thought I'd come and mark maybe 10, 15 pages and I've marked half the book because it's beautiful. So we'll see how many of it we get through, but it's nice the way that it's put together, okay? So the way the book opens is you've got three stories which run after each other. And that is a story of the three guys of the band prior to Emerson, Lake and Palmer. And that's the only time that we really talk about anything outside of what that band did. So it's a little bit about their childhood, not too much because a lot of books can kind of oversell that era. Sometimes that really works. There's a couple that spring to mind where actually that to me was the most exciting part of the book because you learn things about an individual that you just didn't know. Other times you kind of think, get to the bit I like. Um, and that I would say 90% of them are, yeah. I would agree with that, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, thankfully, what's covered is a little bit of their childhood, a little bit about why music was important to them and whether they got support through the families or lessons or whatever it was. And then really it's more about their musical history. So what were their early bands? What, what did they join? What influenced them? Where did the ideas come from? And then obviously with these three, they were seen as a super group, probably one of the first, the first super group, because obviously you had one chap come from King Crimson, one from the Nice, one from Atomic Rooster, and there was a little bit of cynicism, as we all have about supergroups. And that's, that cynicism is still, we still have that cynicism about supergroups and often quite well placed. ELP are definitely an exception that proved the rule in, in, in that case, because definitely greater than the sum of the parts, I would suggest, very talented individuals. I would argue they never came close to matching. Or oh, well, maybe prior, maybe prior. We, we're talking Crimson, we're talking The Nice, we're talking Atomic Rooster. Some amazing music there, yeah. you know? But as ELP, wow. That's, that's chemistry, that's when something works, and that's when nobody else could have made that music, especially at that time, pioneers, and you get a lot of that in the book. So I, I like that an awful lot. There's a lot of talk on how the songs and the music and the shows were constructed, put together, knocked into shape, and then evolved. So, you know, I, I like that as well. It's a very interesting, but a guy like me, I want to hear about the music. I, I, I wrote a little comparison because I recently was given the uh, Rob Halford autobiography, which came out not that long ago, Confess. And it's a good read. I enjoyed it. Um, and the way that I would look at that uh, is that that is Rob's story. And it's the story of the lead singer of a guy who happened to be in Judas Priest. Yeah. Is the way that I kind of view that book. Do you know, it's very much, that's his story and it's personal. He clearly wanted yeah, that, to. Yeah, that, that book is not the story of Judas Priest. No, no, that story is not, that book is not the story of Judas Priest. This book is the story of Emerson, Lake and Palmer. There's no fluff. There's no personal stuff. There's no fighting. No fighting. There's no dirt. There's zero dirt. This Never is happened. the cleanest music book I've ever read. They love each other. <laughs> Okay, and I'm down with that. Do you know, where we are now with a career and where we are now with these individuals, only one of the three left, unfortunately. Do I need, I, I need to hear lots of dirt? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do you know, I mean, there, there is actually a quote, I think from Keith, I didn't mark it, where he says, do you know, why is it people always want to hear about the dirt? They want to hear about all, you know, the, the machinations that go on and the things that happen. It's because, because the dirt go. sells, man, the dirt sells. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, sometimes you hear the dirt and it really, you think, oh, and it does blow your mind. You think, oh, I don't know if I can kind of, 
you know, reconcile with that, with this band that I love. I mean, people see- I mean, here's the thing, two of the three guys are no longer with us. So I think out of respect for those two, this probably was the right thing to do and the right way to go about it. There's another time and another place for that kind of book. And that that kind of book exists. If you want to hear the Dirt on Emerson, Lincoln, Palmer, it's out there. So, So let's just celebrate them with this. And that's what this book is. It's a celebration and it's a really good celebration. It is candid. They don't, yes, it, I mean, it's bigging the band up and it's obviously for fans who are going to, like myself, love the music. So you think, well, it works for that audience, but they're not completely deluded. It's not just everything we made was absolutely fantastic and we loved it all, <clears throat> you know? I mean, it's telling, I've got the page number written down later on, but it's telling out of a book that's 272 pages long, how little is from Love Beach onwards. You know, it's it's a very small portion of the book. And I understand that because these guys were genuinely groundbreaking. And what happened with the first four studio albums and pictures at an exhibition, wow, changed the face of music completely. Really did in such a variety of, of ways. And the book does a really good job of explaining that musically, but also in the terms of showmanship, the size of venues that they were playing, the on-stage antics that were going on, usually one out of the three, it has to be said, but, you know, they were pioneers in that sense. Prog bands were serious. And I'm not suggesting that they weren't serious. These guys could play, you know? And that's what really comes across here is just how important the music is. It's all about the music. It's all for the music. When they fall out, it's about music. And it seemed to be so vital to, to what they were all about. And that really comes across in the book. They talk about song construction. They talk about composing, usually alone, it has to be said, and then bringing it in and knocking it into shape. In other words, somebody else going, I don't like that a bit, or whatever it may be. But that's the journey that the music took. Sometimes they were very much, this is mine and we can't change it. And other times it was brought to the group and we can all change it. Let's make it something better. And that is covered in, in quite good detail in the book. You hear about recording sessions, you hear about where they rehearsed, you hear about the kind of, some of the friction that it caused, who worked in different ways. The lyrics took a long, long, long time to create as the band went on, but the music was quite instantaneous. People were inspired to say, this is what I'm all about, this is what I'm going to do, bring it in and it's ready. And then they would wait for weeks for the lyrics to get shaped around that which is hard if it's not the music that you've written. So that was very interesting. And if you want a book about a band and how a band works on a musical level and how you then transport that into initially theatre shows, but then stadium shows, three guys on a stage. I mean, we've all seen bands that can't fill a stadium. Not, I don't mean with physical people, I mean, they're on, a, they're on a stage, they've got huge music, they start to play, and it doesn't fill the stadium, it doesn't work, it's too big for it. <clears throat> ELP, it worked. And no Just need for the all the backup singers, no need for like a horn section or additional keyboard players and guitarists and so on and so forth, right? Yeah. Yes, and, and that is one of the key things that comes across as, as you read this, how important that was to them. It was crafted, it was really thought about, they really looked at what would make for an interesting spectacle, musically, visually, and all together. And then what a ginormous, you know, enterprise it was to then take that out on the road. Because it just got bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more people. And there were a few accidents along the way. There are no, well, not no, there's very little to, to coin a phrase, rock and roll hijinks. You know, this is not, these guys are not crazy rock stars. They are not trashing hotel rooms. There are two or three stories that people may know or may not, but I won't spoil them because they're in here that genuinely made me laugh out loud. But they're fun. They're not, oh my God, it's, this, is, this is not Motley Crue, okay? Right, and I'm, I must admit, I'm happier, and I'll maybe say more about me than them, I'm happier reading this than I am about the rock and roll hijinks that's fun and it's interesting and it has its place and I have quite a lot of books that do have that. I often get to the end of a a music biography, autobiography, career retrospective and think, but what about the music? You didn't tell me anything about the music. This book is all 
about the music. So if that strikes you as your kind of thing, I think you'll struggle to get better than this. <clears throat> That's a grand statement. What I will say on the flip side is because of the way it's constructed, it can be a little disjointed. So there's not somebody saying, well, in the beginning and then working through until in the end, okay? The story does run like that, or the story, the facts run like that, but because it's all snippets of interviews, some quite long, most quite short, you do kind of think, well, we've kind of covered that. That's kind of been a little bit repeated at times. And then there's a section in the book where we seem to just kind of go, okay, well, we've covered the first three albums and the shows, but let's talk about them as a live band and we kind of go back again. But I loved it because it's the sort of thing I want to read about. If you're looking for the story of ELP, this is what this is, but it's not quite that book. Yeah. Well, so, you know, one of the things that, that we were talking about uh, off camera before we started today is, and I absolutely 100% agree with, with this, is a great music or band's biography or autobiography has to make you want to go and listen to the music during it and when you're done. And sometimes for a long period of time. And I think one of the things, and I I, again, I agree with you 100%. There is a time and a place to read a rock bio or autobiography that's got all the dirt. And those are fun. They can be a lot of fun. And sometimes it's stories you've heard, sometimes you haven't heard, and you get done, you're thinking, wow, that was great rock and roll trash and excess. Doesn't necessarily make you want to go listen to the music. But a great rock bio that talks all about the albums and the songs and who was in the producer's chair and the tours and all that and who opened and how they changed the sets. Those are the ones that make you want to go and reinvestigate the catalog over and over again during the read and after the read. I'll, I'll stop there. But yeah, absolutely. So I think we know which camp this one is in. Well, you're exactly right, Peter. As you see, we were discussing this just before we started there. And as you do, I picked up this book. I read a little bit at the start, thought, you know, what's the tone, what's it like? And it does, it takes you through the guy's early years and then into those bands. And then as soon as it hit the Emerson, Lake and Palmer era, I had to stop and get the phones on and listen to the album that they were talking about. And okay, some of them sections are shorter, some of them are longer, so you're, I kind of scooted off in the other areas that were relevant to the time as I was listening, but it, it definitely made me want to listen to the music that was being discussed in the book. It made me want to hear the songs that they were talking about, you know, the, the compositions, songs as maybe selling ELP, a, a long way shot, in actual fact. Uh, and it does definitely bring into focus just how groundbreaking and daring they were, do you know, and having to force labels into releasing things like pictures at an exhibition in the right way to make sure that it got out to an audience and only really convincing Atlantic in America that it should be out there and it should be a budget album because it was quite short when they realised that the amount of import copies that were being sold in America and suddenly people are going, oh, hold on, <laughs> we're missing a trick here, you yeah. know? Oh, yeah. um, and, and it's insight like that that you get. And okay, we kind of know some of these stories, but hearing it from the right people in the right way it is very good and thoroughly enjoyable. And it's definitely a, a, a book that inspired me to go and listen to the albums. Now, without giving too much away, we're recording out of a sequence that's in my head, okay? Because we have an In The Prog show, In The Prog Seat show that's going out on Tuesday, which we haven't recorded yet. Right, Sorry, so, so for those of you watching, that happened last night. So there yep. you go. You, you've okay. probably so, already seen that. Yeah. So as Peter says, it's the, the magic of, of Sea of Tranquility. We're recording this when we can and then showing them in the right orders. It's inspired me to choose one of my choices for the show that you've hopefully just watched. Okay. Because it talks about, and spoiler if you haven't, if you haven't watched in the prog seat yet, Leave the room now, as they say about this, you know, the, the sports results. If you, haven't, if you haven't seen the results, leave the room now and I'll tell you all about them, okay? But for the show, what we're doing is, well, five prog albums that we don't really connect with, okay? And I don't connect with the works. Now, I don't connect with the works for reasons. I don't hate it. But it's everything that's wrong about a band. That's why I chose it for the show we haven't recorded yet that you've all seen. Okay, um, because it, 
absolutely illustrates a band with no boundaries. It illustrates a band that have maybe bought into their own hype. It illustrates a band where the members are beginning to really jostle for supremacy. And that, to me, always needs somebody to corral it. There needs to be either a band leader out of the people in the band or a manager or a producer that has just got that iron fist that will say, no, that's the wrong thing to do. And this is why. And Emerson, Lake and Palmer at this stage didn't have that. But the works is covered in really, really good detail in here. Uh, it's the most candid part of the book. They don't hide from the fact that Love Beach was a flawed endeavour from the very beginning because they didn't really want to make that album at that time. That's not hidden in any shape or form. And they honestly and openly admit that in ways it was clear to everybody that they didn't really believe in that endeavour even once it was finished. You know, they didn't kind of cover that up in the way that a lot of bands will tell you it's, it's our best album, when clearly it was never going to be their best album. But the works, they actually go into quite great detail about what the initial ideas were behind that. And that was that Keith, Keith Emerson wanted to be a composer. I mean, he is a composer, was a composer. He composed yeah. lots of phenomenal music, both inside this band and outside of this band. But that was where his heart lay and it was where his passion lay. And he's also candid enough to admit that an awful lot of that came about because of the criticism that he and the band received for continually reworking classical pieces. And that, you know, accusation that, well, he's doing that because he can't write it. So he clearly wanted to write it. And I understand that. And it was always intended to kind of be a solo endeavour, but it wasn't allowed to be because of all the pressures that work on a band that's making that amount of money for that amount of people. That's the truth. So, you know, and everyone wants their bands to go on forever, but sometimes they need to go and do something else to make it better when it does that again. ELP, it would appear, never got that opportunity. So it was an ambitious endeavour. And then it was one that kind of grew arms and legs as the other members of the band kind of thought, well, I could do this. I'm already thinking about doing that. Let's bring it all together and do it in this. But the misgivings that they have as they discuss that period where they kind of go, yeah, but we knew it was wrong at the time. <clears throat> some of that is great hindsight, but I do believe that some of that with them genuinely kind of going, this is going to be amazing or fantastically rubbish, do you know? <laughs> and to be fair, it's neither. It's not fantastically rubbish, but it was the wrong thing to do. It was a grand folly, is maybe the best way of putting it, but they accept that in the book uh, and then go on to admit the glorious disaster that the tour was that kind of kicked off with the full orchestra that only went for 30 shows or whatever it was before. They just couldn't keep it on the road because it was so expensive, even though, and as it says in the book, people in the know who'd done this with bands previously had actually contacted them and just said, no, 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 don't do it, don't do it. But when you're in the moment and someone's telling you that, you immediately think, oh, that's, they couldn't do it, but I can do it. And that's exactly where they were. But musically, they got such fulfilment. The three of them got such fulfilment out of taking out on the road that they feel it was worth it even for just that short period of time. And that's the kind of insight that you'll get in this book. So it takes us all the way through the story. And as I say, 272 pages in the book, obviously there's little bits at the start and the end of that but we're at page 223 before Love Beach arrives. So that tells you, I mean, the story itself, I mean, there's credits and then a little bit from the editors and various things at the back. So the story finishes on page 260. So there's 37 pages. Remember that there's quite a lot of pictures in this book yeah. that covers Love Beach, Black Moon and In the Hot Seat. That tells you where the focus of the book is. But it tells you where the fans' focus is too. I mean, if I'm going to go and listen to ELP, yeah, do you know what? From time to time, those albums come out. But it's from time to time. I don't think there's going to be too many fans who are going to complain that not enough attention was given to Love Beach and going forward. I mean... No, but what I will say, I mean, and I'm going to open it soon because what really, to me, sells the book. The book's an interesting read and I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's not the most comprehensive book on any band that you're going to find. That's the truth of the matter. But I don't think it's really been started with that intention. It's very much a visual representation with a story that runs really strongly alongside it. So let, let's open the book. Let's actually have a look. And as I said, I marked, the intention was to mark 10, 15 pages. I've 
<laughs> okay, so we may or may not look at all of these. You, it's like you got a deck of cards, like kind of. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what it's like. I genuinely was putting these post-its in earlier on and kind of thought, oh man, oh man, I'm really sorry, Peter. <laughs> We're going to be here all day. <laughs> so, I mean, just to start at the start, no, as I can't even get the first one out of it, that's a good start. So, as expected, welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. Ladies and gentlemen, Emerson, Lake and Palmer. Okay, so this is the kind of standard that we're looking at. It's a beautifully put together book with great shots and a lot of thought about how it's presented. It really, the imagery really helps tell the story of what you're reading as you, as you flick through the pages. Um, and there's lots of grandiose shots and lots of shots that you've seen before. There are some really, he says, about to show one he hasn't even marked, but the inside cover, I mean, that's iconic. Oh, yeah, you know. Yeah, I mean, we've all seen this. This is the whole crew, the whole tour. There's people up here and all that. And that's one of those shots that, I mean, that's just a classic <clears throat> prog rock photograph. Do you know, no band has ever done that. That's like, if, if you look up in the dictionary, yes, that, that thing that no longer exists, the dictionary, <laughs> and you look up 70s prog rock excess, that's the yeah, shot you get. That's it, yeah, absolutely. So that's here we are. This is, this is, okay. This is the nice that we're looking at here. Yeah. So this is just a rehearsal shot. And as I say, there's still lots and lots of narrative working alongside these fantastic photographs. So there's some photographs in here that have never been seen before. Now, they tend to come from things like maybe a college book where they played a show somewhere and someone's taking shots. And the photographs are not great. You can see why they're not iconic shots, but it's nice to see them. I like that kind of thing. So I haven't really marked all of those because if anyone does want to buy the book, I don't want to spoil the whole book, it has to be right. said, you know, but I've marked an awful lot. So you do also get some, you know, nice shots here. Greg Lake when he was young, early singles, and we're moving on into Crimson Era. So it doesn't ignore those times. They are well covered. Um, and obviously, Carol's been a, a strong part of the book, so you get him when he's very young here. Carol Martin using a family trade name for playing on stage and here he is you know very young playing his drums learning his trade hitting them as hard as he possibly can i've no doubt because that's what he likes to do but, you know but there's some great shots here's atomic rooster nice yeah looking suitably what's going on yep. <laughs> that's such of its time isn't it no, but it was such a great time um, and to let you know how much I've marked in this book, I've even marked the next page because it, it's definitely worth showing that yes, there's lots and lots of words, but when you want to do a double page shot, oh yeah, nice, you do a double page shot. So we're right at the start of the band here, yeah. right at the start. I mean, we don't all look delighted to be here. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe that was on purpose, right? <laughs> yeah, I think that's I think that's meant to be mean and moody. Yeah, that's serious. Meant one. to be mean and moody. I'm not quite convinced that it makes it actually works as mean and moody. But what does work, and I've maybe marked another one later on, because as a guy that used to play drums an awful lot when I was younger and haven't done for a good few years now, man, oh man, I do hope I look like this when I played. I hope I look like this. There you go. Oh, look at the attack. He's killing them. He's absolutely killing them, isn't he? He's almost making the guitarist face, right? You know. The... <laughs> you just, I mean, you look at that, you think, those skins were never used again. <laughs> You know, and then you go from that, you go to this is at Keith's house, 10th April 1970. So here they are, just two guys chilling out. And I love those extremes. There's a band that are absolutely killing it on stage. And there's two guys having a chat because that's a reality. You go on stage, that's the persona, that's what you're portraying. You've got gongs the size of Belgium, you know, that are just ridiculous and fantastic. Do you know, and then you go and sit on somebody's nineteen seventies brown sofa and have a chat over a cup of tea because that's yeah. what really happens, unless of course you dress like this. Because oh, if you I dress know. like this, then obviously what really happens is you go to another planet and you yeah. rule that planet because <clears throat> that's just phenomenally ridiculous, isn't it? And I love it. Time. That's that takes that takes ridiculous to a new level. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think he just right out. He just out Wakeman, Rick Wakeman on that one. Yeah, who needs a cape? Who needs a cape? Who needs a cape? Instead, uh, wear this 
puffy. But thing, you've got these whatever. things. Who needs a cape? Do you know? But then I do love these kind of candid shots. You know, this is just rehearsal sometimes. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. You know, and, and I, I love it when you see eye contact between band members at this stage because this is how the music's made. Yeah. Anyone that's, I mean, I haven't played in real bands, but I've played in lots of bands. Anyone that knows about that stage, it's all about that eye contact. What's happening? What are we doing? Where's it going? Is it working? Where should I have to, where should I, you know, take this next? Sometimes it's fantastic and other times it's utter nonsense. But seeing that chemistry, and I, I do a lot, I mean, this is an iconic shot. Yeah, yeah. I love that shot. And I love the fact that this guy is here purely because he refused to move. That's why he's here. You would think that's a great artistic composition. Who is this chap? Who did they, who did they get to go and sit here? Who was he really? He's the chap that refused to move when the photograph was getting taken. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody cares who he is, but he's that guy. <laughs> yeah, he's that guy. But I, I just love that, that somebody actually thought, do you know what? No, we're not going to take that somewhere else. We're going to take that with him in it. And it's better because he's there. And it is better because he's there. Because you ask all these questions. Why is he there? What's he doing? Do you know? So here we are. What's, 19... what's great about that is he's a guy who probably doesn't hasn't a clue who these three dudes are, right? He's like, I'm yeah. not moving. Who, who are you? Right? Yeah. I probably never saw the photograph. No, never, never. He you know, me. never knew the significance of it or the fact that I'm talking about it 40 years later. <laughs> right. And actually, he looks pissed in the shot, like they're bothering him, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, no doubt about it. That'd be probably sat there all day, every day. This is my spot. This is my spot. <laughs> <laughs> so then you go from that, you go to the Oval, which is a cricket ground in England uh, in 1972. And I love these shots of bands that are playing ginormous events. But because of the time, stadiums weren't like huge things in the UK. So what you've got is if you lived around the Oval, you've got a free show. Wow. Look at that. I mean, look at the mass of people. Do you know, look at the command on stage. And then you think somebody is sitting in their kitchen, either watching or enduring this, because if this is not your cup of tea, <laughs> Then EOPs are still in your kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that I, I mean, I really do. And there are lots of kind of big grand shots like that in here of some of the ginormous events that, that these guys played at, um, which are covered in really good detail as well in the book. Here's, you know, rehearsal shots. Various like that. It's just, this is actually where at this stage, and I'll just read the last line. So all the text in here is just detailing the equipment the guys were using at this stage. Okay, because somebody had, had finally convinced them that they really needed to get insurance. And it's just, it just finishes with, because it's just a list of symbols and moves and various things. All in all, we had between us around £100,000 worth of equipment. And you think, well, in 1970... <laughs> Just wait oh. and quadruple that in just like two years, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, we're talking millions of pounds worth of equipment on stage in real terms. But then, if you want to see style, okay, if you want style, I mean, I am definitely, I mean, I'm definitely going to get an out outfit like this. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, I'm almost beyond words. I mean, and the amazing thing is, I mean, the theatrical guys in the band, it's like, I mean, did, did they even get the same memo? Do you know? I mean, we've, we have still got someone that's just arrived from outer space. Okay, we've got someone that's just off the streets. Sorry, Carl. But, and some of his haircuts. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Says me. <laughs> there you go. And then we've, got, we, then we've got a wedding singer. It, it's such a great mix. <laughs> What is, what is the band like? But it didn't matter, did it? Ah, you know, the it 70s. Oh, Gotta love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but here we go. Here we go. I absolutely adore this shot, okay? Double page spread. This is absolutely over-the-top stagecraft. And then in the background, you see just how normal it is, okay? Wow. You've got a guy who's just hauling a ginormously heavy organ onto the floor, pounding it to death, he's got daggers in there, the crowd are going wild. And in the background, you've got a guy, I see this every night. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I mean, I, I absolutely. I mean, I never saw this band. I never saw this band, as I'm sure an awful lot of people watching this didn't. You know, anyone that did, take my hand off to you, and you're very lucky, very fortunate. Um, but you also get lots of things like this. You know, here's... Paper clippings, I do like these. So this is an advert about Carol winning lots and lots of Best Drummer Awards in a year. How's that? ELP, 
the seven, is that right? Was hit seven. I'm reading it backwards on the screen here. And this is I'm getting seven melody uh, melody maker awards in the same year. They basically swept the boards. They got absolutely everything. And then you've got another great Carol shot. There's some great shots of Carol on the drums in, in this book. Um, and but then you also I like this shot as well. Okay. Just mean and moody. Picture tells a story, as they say. And it's just it's a fantastic look of concentration. Yeah. There's a, there's a look of kind of melancholy about him as well, um, which shows the highs and lows of being in a band as well. I think sometimes when you're operating at that level, the pressures that are there, which do come across, but they seem to have managed to kind of isolate themselves from it a little bit at stages, but then there are points where it maybe becomes too much. This is not even a picture of a band, but this is just a picture of where they're playing. Okay. That's a lot of people in Soldier Field. Okay, that's a lot of people. 250,000 tickets sold. They reckoned once this picture was actually seen that there was about 350,000 people there. <sighs> wow. I mean, I've been in, you know, 70,000 at Donington for a variety of shows and it felt like a ginormously ridiculous amount of people. You can't imagine, you know, times that by five and, and kind of living through that. Great composite shot here. That's a classic, isn't it? And that, that's that's a real artist at work. I love the way that the band members are kind of looking at each other. They're obviously yeah. not in that position at all. That's They're poster really worthy right there. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah. Um, and then you get little adverts at the site here, which I haven't even marked it for. But just, you know, tour adverts, paper adverts, things like that, which are, are really, I, I like that. It takes you to a time and a place. Then you've got Carl Jam. So Emerson Lake and Palmer actually commissioned the stage. They built it because they were obviously doing things that nobody else were doing at the time. But then you see how basic it is. Do you know? And there were stories of some of these lights falling and various things and, you know, clattering into Carol's drums that he was playing and, you know, um, and that's when the organisation started to get a whole lot bigger uh, because it just it simply had to. And then we get to the trappings of fame. We're now at the stage where they're a ginormous act. So here's three guys, you know, kicking back and relaxing on the Learjet. This is where we are here. So, you know, we're in private plane territory now. Uh, and it's interesting because the other thing that the book allows you to do because of the visuals that go along with the story is you start off with three guys that came from very little, you know. There was, you know, families that were spending money they didn't have to give their kids instruments that they went on to make their fame and fortune with. And we go from that to pictures of, on Learjets jets, and then riding through the streets on phenomenal motorbikes. So you know, you know, wearing beautiful all leathers and all this sort of stuff. And then you see it do this. It starts to teeter, and it starts to just go pop over the edge. How do you know when the band is not operating as it should? Well, they've all got their own transport. That's how you know. Once it stops being the band in the van or the band in the car, or even the band in the Learjet, and becomes a limo each. So, you know, that's when we're heading to Love Beach. That's yeah, that's someone's true. not talking to someone else. And yeah, 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 exactly. And also when you can be convinced that this is how you want people to see you, reality is maybe just, I just can't quite reach reality. Because, I mean, even in this temple, that is sitting here, okay, I never want to be photographed like this. <laughs> but I take my heart off to them because, you know, everyone involved in this book loves these people, I mean, Carol's still with us, and they've put that in, because this is a true representation of what's happening at the time, so, you know, and, and it, it is a really good representation of, of what's happening at the time. So here is Greg uh, filming a video for Father Christmas, one of the very few Christmas songs that I can actually cope with still stands up. That's a fantastic photograph. It makes no sense. Playing Father Christmas with camels in the background. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, genuinely in the desert. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Oh, um, boy. <laughs> and then you get, I mean, there's iconic shots like this. I, I do, this, this, is, that, that's, this is a great photograph here. Hmm. You know, and much so there are troubles in the band at various points. I do really like 
the fact that there are so many photographs, even at times like Love Beach, the smiles on the faces. These guys don't even pretend in the book that they were best friends. They were great musical companions. And that's where all of the brotherhood came from. But there's a definite respect. And I think that's a lot to do with also how the book's constructed. That's why the dirt's not there. There's a genuine respect for what, excuse me, they could do together. So here's a Love Beach outtake. <clears throat> now I've shown that, I mean, we've, we've all seen the Love Beach cover and the band don't even hide from the fact that that's not a good idea. Okay, it's also not how to connect with, you know, the masses. This is how our lives are now. Okay, what I love about this next picture, so much so that I actually went and showed my other half just before I came through to do this. I have to show you these two photographs. So I showed her the last one, and then I had to show her this one. Okay, so this is from the same sessions, and I don't know in, in this light if you'll see it, because they've clearly been in the water, but it's obviously warm, so they've dried. Everything has dried, apart from the person who happened to be wearing white trousers crotch. That's the only thing that's not dry in that photograph. Do you know, Keith Emerson will forever look like he's peed himself in this photograph. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's classic. Holy you know, cow. It's, yeah. <laughs> you know? And I don't even know if that's going to be mentioned because he's smiling wider than everyone else. So maybe they haven't been in the water at this stage. I don't know. Maybe that's why they went in the water. <laughs> if they weren't in the water, he either had an accident or, man, he sweats a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And now, now we know we're in 1992 because we're into that era of where any band that weren't, you know, shoegazing and wearing cardigans because that's what rock and roll became, okay? All look like they're in a men's knitwear catalogue. Yeah. Do you know? That, that, this is maybe even more tragic in that sense, because they're, they're coiffured here. This yeah. is stylized. This is, you see those early shots for long, straggly, genuinely unkempt hair. You know, wings and whatever you would call these things, and then they go from that to being dressed by, you know, Marks and Spencers or whatever. They're in their 40s now, gotta look GQ, right? So absolutely. And if you're if you're in your 40s and you want to look GQ, then you have to go on the Jay Leno show, don't you? <laughs> and, and it's amazing watching these ginormous bands and the journey that they went on. And as their audience ages, the difference in what they have to try and do to connect with those people. And we criticize these bands for getting that probably. 75 to 90 percent of them, unlike you and me, Peter, well, they grew up. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. You know, they became that that thing that I've heard of but never been an adult. So, you know, well, actually, they had to be enticed back into the fold. They were enticed back into the fold by short, tidy hair and appearances on chat shows because that's what they were watching and looking like at that stage. Yeah. Yeah. Not me, but there you go. So then we go all the way through to the end of the story, which is 2010, and we're at high voltage. Okay, so this is the last show that the band played together. Um, and that's how we go at the top. Headlining, uh, you know, on the final day of a huge festival back in, in the UK, which was obviously the home of where they started, playing to a crowd this size. Mm -hmm. You can see that if I like, there we go. That's the way to go. If you're going to go, that's the way to go, isn't it? So, you know, they started at the top because they already had a name. They already had success behind all three in different ventures. And then they took that way higher. They really soared to a peak that was just ridiculous, beyond ridiculous. Could do really whatever they wanted, you know, pianos twirling on stage and various things that nobody else was doing yeah. back then. I mean, you think about, you know, like off at a tangent, mentioned them for the second time in an Emerson, Lake and Palmer show, Motley Crew, and drum riders going around there and everyone going, oh man, oh man, that's amazing. No one's done that before. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, um, and this this is prog rock, man. This is this is pipe and slippers it's meant to be. That's what this is meant to be. But oh, this, this, is, this was an extravaganza. And yes, there's a few albums in there that don't quite hit that mark, but to go out at the top, it made me, I mean, I obviously knew where the book was going because 
that's where the book is going. But it made me smile to see those pictures and to see three smiling faces as well and to get that adulation at that stage in the career. Sometimes absence does make a heart grow fonder. You yeah. do wonder if they just continued on with albums that were not as fantastic as the albums that they released, you know, back in the, the early 70s. That if we would just look at them and kind of go, nah, do you know, and at the risk of getting too deep into it and changing the comments that are going to be below, would I rather that they went out in 2010 playing that music at that level to that standard than what's currently happening with a band that I deeply love, like Genesis? Well, I know which way I would prefer it to have fallen, put it that way. And much though I love both bands, given a choice, it would be this. Good. So this is the Emerson, Leith and Palmer book. Okay, this comes out at the end of November, start of December, just in time for Christmas, folks. And you need to go to all the W's, www.elpbook.com to pre-order. All three stroke five variants are still, still available. And certainly the version that I've been lucky enough to spend the last few weeks with is well worth it well worth it as i say at the moment this is 40 pounds on the website i'll give you 40 pounds for this every day of the week it's really good and i thoroughly enjoyed it there you go cool. looks like a good one yeah you know i mean i have fond memories of the lp i only saw them once i saw them here on that there was a big package tour i don't even remember what year it was early mid 2000s deep purple elp and dream theater it was great because I had never seen them, right? So for me, I was like, I had seen both the other bands obviously many times, but it was cool to see ELP uh, on that bill as well. And uh, yeah, that's it, you know. And and I, you know, one of the things that you mentioned, which I think hit home for me, is that you know the last studio album they did was in the hot seat. You know, spoiler alert for people watching: uh, if you didn't see last night's in the prog seat show, that may or may not have shown up on my list. Uh, it's a pretty bad album. Um, and thankfully, I think they did enough live appearances post that, which makes that not hurt as much. In other words, I think if like in the hot seat was the last thing we ever heard and saw from ELP, that would kind of sting a little bit. Thankfully, they had plenty of live performances and that big performance, the last show they ever did, which I think is, you know, the way you want to go out, right? Yeah, that, that's, I mean, maybe more fortunate than planned. You know, and who am I to, to spoil any band's fun or whatever it may be with the comments that I made about Genesis? And, and if you've gone to see them and you've thoroughly enjoyed them, then great. That's that's all you can ask for out of any kind of show. I only saw that band once and that was with Ray Wilson singing. That is officially the wrong lineup. I loved it. It was great. I heard songs live that I wanted to hear live and some that I maybe didn't, but it was a great performance and I thoroughly enjoyed it. So I'm not belittling that, however, if a band is fortunate enough to look like they've maybe gone out more on their own terms, more through events than, than design, that maybe, then it's, it's a, a good thing in that sense. And as you say, Peter, because as well, they were also, I think, honest enough to kind of take a step back and go, Do you know, we're going to play the songs that people want to hear. That's what comes across in the book about that, those kind of you know, final shows is that they wanted to go out and play these songs to people who it really meant something to, fans that had followed them all the way through, and that that journey, as we all do with the music we love, that that music had really been part of their lives, but then also to play it to people who'd never seen them. Do you know, and, and they, although it's not covered in great detail, it's clear that they didn't just kind of, you know, go, you know, we know these songs, we've been playing these songs for years, turn up the day before, have a chat, you know, strum through a couple and we'll be good. There was weeks of work went into even the final show to make sure that what they presented on stage was something that they would say, well, that is Emerson, Lake and Palmer. Right, right. And there was no compromise about the live shows at all, even though clearly with the way the book is structured that they look at some of those later albums as well and kind of go, do you know? But also even for a band of that size, and, and it's relevant to some other things that, that we've spoken about and will speak about on the channel in, in times to come. Even bands that you look at and think, wow, they are you know, so big that they must be able to do anything they want. Well, the works was maybe that, for Emerson, and Lake and Palmer. But beyond that, clearly they weren't just doing whatever they wanted. 
there was an awful lot of outside pressures and people that had ideas of what should be selling at this stage and we need to get the charts and all that pressure that they'd had at the very start and they kind of, you know, bowed to ever so slightly, but pushed back on massively. Even with that success behind them, they couldn't quite push back on it anymore because it's all about units, 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 or it was then. Things have changed yeah. now in, 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 a, in a good way and sometimes not so good way. So, but that too comes through in the book. It takes you through the eras, not right to now, because obviously the music industry has changed massively in the last 30 years again, but it takes you through the eras of what music was about. The 70s, and probably why we talk about it so much on this channel, really was an era where it was about innovation. It was about testing the boundaries. What can we make that nobody's ever made before? And in many ways, it's understandable. That is maybe the main element that has lacked in a lot of genres, not all of them, but in a lot of genres for quite some time now. Yeah. So to be able to be kind of taken through that journey as well is really, it's, I really have enjoyed it. I can't recommend it highly enough. But there are aspects about the book that people who are looking for certain things will not find. That's, that's the truth of the matter. But as an Emerson Lake and Palmer fan, I love the book. I thought it was really good. <laughs> good. Well, that's what it's all about, right? Yeah. So everybody make sure you go hop on over to www.elpbook.com and pre-order your copy. Uh, like Stephen says, just in time for the holidays, right? So uh, that's always a good thing. I think they set those things up exactly like that, right? Let's... What a coincidence. Who did yeah, that? Gee, surprise. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, before we go, I do want to give a little preview of a similar type show that I will be doing uh, probably within the next week or two. I just... Just got back from vacation and I have to kind of get through it, but uh, look for a similar type review on Loud and Proud 50 Years of Nazareth by oh. our very own Martin Popoff. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. So I'm not going to give too much of a preview because I'll, I'll save it for, you know, if you are a Nazareth fan, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, uh, stay tuned band. for more of that. <laughs> There's a band that have not had much of that kind of coverage that really deserve it. Wow. Right. Oh. And that's why the Blue Oyster Cult book he did and the Uriah Heat book he did are so noteworthy. And then the Thin Lizzy one, because these bands don't get enough of that type of treatment. Uh, also, he just released one on Yes. So I'm going to have to get that as well. But uh, yeah, ex exactly. So uh, stay tuned for that a lot more here on the channel. I want to thank Stephen for uh, this wonderful review and summary of the uh, new ELP book. And like I said, go out and get your copy. And uh, while you're at it, Visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube all the damn time. Boy, it feels good saying that again. I thought I'd be out of practice, but not at all. So. <laughs> and by the wonders of the way we record these things, you guys have no idea what I'm talking about. But anyway, we'll, we'll get to that later on. So uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Click on that notification bell if you want to make a channel donation. The link to our Ko-Fi page is below, as well as the link to our merch page where you can get cool Hudson Valley Square shirts. And I'll show it off again. I've been trying to do it nonchalantly. The brand new uh, water bottles or you know whatever you want to put in there bottles uh and then of course uh catranquility.org our webzine which is celebrating 20 years on the internet this year hard to believe and in, in a couple of months i won't have to say that anymore so it's <laughs> month of 21. uh thanks for watching everybody for Stephen reed i am pete pardo have a good one everybody take care